Check Taekwondo, is it working, more or less? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yep. OK, cool. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, GitHub's backend right now, because for no particular reason, because I understand that most people just don't care about this. Like, we do a lot of Git in our backend, but everybody else doesn't do huge Git deployments. And people in general just don't give a shit about how to build a scalable Git backend unless you guys are trying to launch a GitHub competitor. In that case, please don't do that, because that would suck. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we do in the backend and how do we work for make, to make it scale. And it's, it's something people don't particularly care about, but I think it's an interesting tale, like not only because it's about Git, but it's because it's actually, it's actually relevant. I think there is very little of Git here, and a lot of the way we write over at GitHub, the way we work internally, and it's worth hearing. And there's no other speakers right now, so I'm going to do it anyway. So deal with it. Oh, hi, my name is Visamarty, but uh, most Americans don't know how to pronounce my name, so they call me VMG by my initials. I have a Twitter account, which is VMG, when I post stupid stuff. And uh, I used to be an indie video game developer, but I woke up one morning and I was trying to hack into my neighbor's Wi-Fi, right? And it struck me that maybe if I had a real job, I could afford paying for my own Wi-Fi. So I did that. I went to San Francisco to work for a startup, which is called GitHub. And that was like three years ago. So of course, back then we were like 10 people, and it didn't really count as a real job either. But we are like 170 now, and things are working out pretty well for us. Now, this is not a story of how GitHub grew to 170 people. This is a story of how our backend grew, grew to be able to host, I think we do uh, 3 million different repos right now. So GitHub had pretty humble beginnings. Uh, the first version we launched, I don't know if you guys remember that, it was almost five years ago. It had this motto, this slogan that was, uh, Git hosting no longer a pain in the ass. And this is real, like, we launched with this slogan, it worked pretty well. I like it, it feels honest, it feels as sincere, uh, humble. I feel it could be even more uh, honest, because it could say, like, Git hosting no longer a pain in the ass for you, not for us, because Jesus, if I ever met the guy who came out with this Git idea, I'm going to shoot poop pellets at him with a paintball gun. Because it's so bad to make this work on the server side. It's so painful. Because uh, hosting Git repos itself is not particularly hard. You know, as it turns out, Git is a distributed version control system. So if you grab a Git, a Git repo and you put that on a server, that single folder has everything that Git needs to be able to push, pull, and clone from it. So you just take that .git folder, what we call a bear repo, you put it on the server, you punch a hole on SSH, and now you're hosting Git repos for people, which is which is pretty convenient. But the tricky part is when you're actually trying to add some value on top of that, when you're trying to uh, show on a web interface, uh, <coughs> show on a web interface, uh, sorry, some kind of useful information about the Git repo itself. So we had this issue that we had no way to go into the Git repo and get information that we could display on the web UI. And since our stack was within Ruby, we uh, Tom Presto 1 is trying to write a small Ruby library called Grid, the Ruby Git interface, that did just that. It just went into the Git repo and was able to parse the internal Git formats and show them on a web UI. It was pretty straightforward. You just pass Grid uh, a folder on the file system. Oh, thank you, man. <laughs> thank you so much. You just... <coughs> 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 You just pass create a folder on the file system, and it opens the Git repo. It's able to perform a lot of very handy operations that you can display on the web UI. And this was pretty straightforward. It worked very well in practice. So we just launched a website like that. It was a single VM, and we just put that VM on a, you know, it was a VM on the cloud. And it was the main Rails application, Ruby on Rails, and Grid, and all the Git repos on the same VM on the same machine. So of course this worked, but like the kids say nowadays, it's not web scale. Because it's a single VM, right? So that's not going to go very far. And in a couple of weeks, we had so many users that we were like, OK, man, we need more VMs. We need to put our main Rails application in several VMs. But we, we had this issue now that uh, we had several VMs with, with the Rails app, but we didn't know where to put the actual Git repos. Because if you put uh, different repos in every single VM, then routing gets very hard. So we came up with this kind of ghetto idea that worked very well in practice. 
which is uh, GFS. Uh, this is not Google File System, this is Global File System, but Red Hat. So the point is that we will have a single big server with a lot of hard disks, with, with all the Git repos in them. And then we will just mount the same server on every single VM. So they, every single VM could access the Git, the Git repos, like if it were on the local hard disk. So that way we could just spin up new VMs, and without changing a single line of code from the main Rails app, you could just access the grid, could access the grid repos, like if they were on the local file system. And this worked pretty well in practice uh, for a couple months, but then we had the same issue that uh, a lot of other startups like Twitter and a lot of other people had, which is that Ruby on Rails was making us slow. And in our case, it was even worse, because it was literal. Like, they were literally making us slow. They just moved Rails to GitHub, and suddenly we had, like, like thousands of people forking that thing and popping pull requests and cloning. And we were not ready for that. We definitely were not ready for that. I mean, it's a great, it's a great uh, problem to have, like, being uh, too famous or having too much success. But it was tricky. It was tricky because uh, we were growing very fast. We had very, very little people. We had to work around that to let people, you know, for Rails. So luckily for us, uh, we had saved enough money by, by then to actually uh, buy real hardware, like actual machines. Amazing, real hardware. Uh, we got some last point data center, and we got uh, four front-end machines, real machines, not virtual machines, and four file servers. And of course, a uh, data database machine. But and we had the hard question now that we had Git repos spread around a lot of servers. So we had to come up with a way of a routing layer that would let us the main front-end machines access the, access the Git repos in the backend. Uh, we came up with something I think pretty smart. We called it Smoke, which is kind of like a cloud, but not quite, and it's blurry. So uh, it was a pretty good idea, and it worked out, it worked out very, very well in practice. Let me, let me talk a little bit about it. Um, this is going to make perfect sense in just a moment. Just give me, give me a moment here. <laughs> Uh, on the right, you have a BERT, which stands for binary Erlang term. It's a, it's a serialization protocol that uses the same uh, 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 term uh, protocol that the Erlang VM uses. So that way, you can actually send uh, Erlang terms over the wire. And on the left, you have Ernie, which uh, doesn't stand for anything. But it's the name of the RPC server that uh, BERT uses uh, to actually c communicate. So the stack looks something like this. When, when the main Rails application uh, wanted to perform a Git operation, what you would do is it would, con it would still do them through Grid, but of course Grid cannot do the operations over the network because it needs a local uh, a repository on the, fi on the file system. So we just monkey patch Grid so it will actually turn those uh, uh, Git calls into RPC calls into the, into the bird serialization protocol and into a thing we call Chimney, which Chimney routes smoke, of course. And it's a Rails store that actually finds on the network in which file server the Git, the Git repo is stored. So that way we can actually route that RPC call into the file server. And then Ernie, the RPC server, <laughs> would take the RPC call, deserialize into Rubyland from Erlang, and perform the Git operation, which now we can do, because now we are in the file server and the Git repo is on the file system. So now we can do the actual uh, Git operation on Grid. Uh, get the result and then send it back to the front end machine, uh, serialized as BERT again. And this was, this was revolutionary for us because it means that we could spin as many new machines as we needed and as many new file servers as we needed. And it also meant that we could continue working on the main Rails application, the github.com website itself, without having to change a little single line of code. Because since everything was monkey patch, all the RPC operations were happening transparently. And we didn't have to restructure the actual Rails application to continue growing the website. So we could ship features and at the same time keep scaling at the same time, which was huge for us. Uh, but a few months after, of course, we just kept growing and growing and growing. And we had uh, vertical scaling issues. I hate saying this. Uh, like, shit was slow. You know? like, it was just... It wasn't running fast enough, not because we weren't uh, distributed, but because the operations, Git operation itself, they were pretty slow. And of course, the main issue we had was Grid itself, because it was a Git library written in Ruby, which is not a good idea, because Ruby is, uh, well, not that fast of a language. So we decided to work around this by shelling out to Git a lot. A lot. I'm, I mean, I'm talking a lot. And that even became a bottleneck, because shelling out is expensive, so we fixed that by... Uh, 
actually sharing out to Git uh, properly, which is actually spawning Git and then parsing back the, the results of the Git comments. But this doesn't really work out on the long run because spawning Git is pretty cheap, but it actually gets a little bit nasty when it comes to parsing back the output of Git commands back into Rubyland. So that was even making us uh, not, not even the startup time, just the parsing and communication time between the spawn process and our main Rails app uh, was, was getting a little bit painful. And luckily for us, this was back then in 2010, and a lot of other people uh, were having issues like very, very close to the same ones we were having. I like to uh, explain this as the story of, of Ed. Ed. Ed was working for another company, right? And he also was trying to make Git scale. They were, uh, they were also having Git scaling issues. So one morning, Ed uh, woke up and he went uh, to his boss and he was like, guys, guys, guys. Uh, and he was like, what do you want, Ed? And Ed was like, I have, I have a great idea, you see. Uh, have, you ever heard, have you ever heard about the Git command line client? Like, why don't we don't take that command line client, right? And we build that Git binary. We build it as a share object, right? You, we take the share object, and then we just link that into our server process. And his boss was like, oh, man, Ed, you're amazing. You just made Git scale on your own. That's brilliant. You just fixed all, all of our problems. So Ed just did that. He just built the Git command line client as a library and just linked that into the server process and used it to communicate with the Git repo using actual uh, ABI calls, na native calls. But he left the server running for a while and he checked the performance graphs and memory usage went something like this, like boop, 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 boop. Now, uh, <laughs> now uh, you know, uh, Ed's boss came up to Ed and I was like, you know, Ed, I've been thinking and maybe there is a chance, there's a possibility that there could maybe be a memory leak here somehow, <laughs> possibly. And Ed said, yeah, well, uh, the thing is that we didn't really think about free memory. You see, because Git is a command line app. So it's going to run once and then it's going to quit. So it would be pretty stupid. It would be a waste of time for Git to free memory. But if you link that to the server process, you kind of want to free that memory because it's going to run for a while. And of course, this is the kind of problem that we could solve very easily with CGI in 1995. <laughs> but we're stuck in the future, and we were like, eh. So luckily for us, this is also the kind of problems. There's a lot of problems in computer science. They just solve themselves. So Ed just left the server running, and the memory usage graph was something like this. Boop, 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 boop. And Ed, Ed boss was kind of concerned. He was like, yo, Ed, I've been, thinking, I've been thinking that this is some very aggressive garbage collection right here. <laughs> like, it almost looks like the server crashed, right? <laughs> and Ed said, no, it didn't crash. It just died, which. <laughs> like, what do you mean it died? Well, as it turns out, Git is a command line app. So it has a very particular way of doing error handling, which is the, just dying. Just prints the error to the STD out and just dies, which is not ideal uh, for a server process. So yeah, that was pretty rough. And uh, luckily for us, there was a lot of other companies, uh, a lot of, lot of people, even in CoreGit, that shared the same uh, concerns. And they had this brilliant idea. They had this idea. They said, uh, why don't we take this, uh, li this library, uh, this uh, Git binary made a library, and we turn that into a new library made from scratch. We'll call it libgit2, where the 2 stands for this time we're going to try to free memory. <laughs> and it was great. It was great. It was great. We got a lot of people from, uh, from CoreGate, even Sean Pierce and a lot of CoreGate contributors working on libgit2 for a while. But some of the contributors to libgit2, uh, especially Sean Pierce and uh, other of, of the Google guys, they found a pretty big showstopper in libgit2. They ha there was a huge design flow in the library, which is that it didn't have enough after factories. So, so they said, how can we fix this? And they said, well, we'll just rewrite it in Java, right? <laughs> uh, so, so J Git was born. And the J stands for Jesus. Did we really need a factory here? <laughs> and jokes aside, jokes aside, uh, J Git is a brilliant uh, uh, Git implementation in Java. But we could never use J Git ourselves, because we don't do Java at GitHub. <laughs> it's true. We don't do Java at GitHub. And people, people think that uh, you know, there's this time of Java. like. At the beginning, nobody was using Java because it was like two new VMs and shit. And then people started using it because it was enterprise and cool. And then people started, started, uh, stopped using it because it was old and crusty and whatever. And now people use it again because uh, it's web scale with parents and closure and things. Uh, 
But people think that we are like just 2005, like at GitHub we are too cool to use Java. And it's not that, it's quite the opposite. Like we are in 1995, like we are way too old to use Java. We have a very specific uh, software design process and we really care about reliability, understanding the software we write and taking responsibility. And we, I've, at least personally, I've always felt that if you really think you understand the JVM, you're either very smart or very wrong. And on GitHub we are pretty fucking stupid, but we like being right all the time. So that's why we use Unix. We use Unix processes, we use uh, Unix tools, we use Unix methodologies. And there's this quote by Ryan Tomeko, which I fucking love. He says, uh, some people think that GitHub is a rail shop, or even a Ruby shop. It's not. Uh, GitHub is, first and foremost, a Unix shop, and everything that is just a detail. So for us, running the JVM in our stack was a huge responsibility that we didn't want to take. We are very sold on Unix, on the Unix way, on using processes for everything, and JGit was not an option for for us. So the only thing we could do, of course, was uh, Libgit2. So we actually had a plan. It was, there is this VMG guy who is kind of autistic and shit, so we just leave him time. He will eventually fix Libgit2, right? But me, me, meanwhile, we had the big issue that uh, we are growing very fast, and people, uh, well, we reached that moment in the life of all the startups when you go that, you know, it's not SQL o'clock, you go that, go get that web scale, and somehow people really wanted us to go get that web scale. Because someday, sometimes, somebody wrote a blog post, like, get the NoSQL store, and everybody was shouting from the rooftops, like, oh my god, Git is like a NoSQL database. It's not. Not at all. It's, it's, it's a version control system. It's not NoSQL. It's just, it has a key value store, but that doesn't mean anything. And people were crazy. Like, I remember a year ago, I was in Amsterdam speaking at, at uh, Iruko. After my talk, uh, this guy came up to me, and he was very excited. He was uh, very friendly, very excited. And he told me, you know, I really, really like GitHub, but I've always wondered, do you guys even Mongo? And I said, that's not a, that's not a word. That's not a sentence, actually. That's, <laughs> not, that's not a thing. To Mongo is not a verb, buddy. Uh, but the thing is that they really wanted us, people really wanted us to go on NoSQL web scale on this thing. Uh, we haven't done that. Uh, why? Well, I'm going to explain it, I'm going to explain it, uh, but first I did need to do an intermission to explain more or less. I guess most of you already know the internal Git data model, but I'm going to give a quick uh, run through it. Now, uh, I really care about design, uh, as you can tell from the slides, I care a lot about design, and uh, that's why the old Git logo, it was keeping me awake at night. I'm not going to lie, I know a lot of people like the old Git logo, but if you look at the old Git logo and you think, what is Git made of? Well, Git is made of uh, poor taste and dubious typographical choices. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, but uh, the new Git logo that my, that my friend Jason Long did, uh, the new rebranding for Git, it's, it's awesome, not because it looks good, but because it gives you a very, very big hint about what is Git all about, which is graphs. Git is all about the graphs, and it's a great thing to show that on a logo. It says, yeah, Git is about the graphs. Uh, I don't know if you know how this works, but when you get a working directory with your files for your project, and you do a commit of that, the first thing that Git does is actually write a tree with that working directory. It turns it into a tree, which is basically a graph, right? So a, a folder is a tree, and it has pointers to the blobs, which are the contents of the files, and it has pointers to other trees, which are the subfolders in your working directory. Now, that single tree gets pointed at by another commit object, which makes another graph on top of that. <coughs> and that commit object has the pointer to the tree, uh, the metadata, like the author, the, t the time, and the message. And it has a pointer to another commit object that basically creates a forest. It creates a tree of, of trees. And that's the way that uh, Git stores it in, <coughs> in the hard disk your, the history of your repo. It just creates a massive graph of the history of your code. Now, this works surprisingly well for, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant implementation when it comes to having a version control system on your hard disk. But if you're trying to do this on the web, uh, things get uh, trickier. Because if you want to do something very easy, like showing a commit, that's very straightforward. Because you got the show one of the commits. So if you have your objects in a data store somewhere, you can just go to the data store and fetch that object and bring it to you. And that's, that's, that's a straightforward. But if, if you're trying to do something more complex, like for instance, showing the log, of a repo, then that gets expensive surprisingly fast. Because if, if your Git objects are not in the same place at the same time, then to actually show that log, you need to go uh, to the data store, fetch the first commit, 
bring back the commit, parse the commit, find the parent of the commit, and then go back to the data store to grab the parent of the commit, and back again, parse it, go back to the data store, back again. And of course, you, you start facing this uh, ancient uh, form of torture called uh, death by round trip, which is extremely painful. And if every single time you have to do a git operation, it involves a network call. That simply doesn't work in practice. It simply doesn't. You, you, you will literally take five minutes to do a, a, a single log operation on a big repo. So, and of course, if you're trying to do something even more uh, fancy, like for instance, showing the last uh, commit that touched a folder, like within GitHub, then the rabbit hole goes incredibly deep. And that was never an option. Like actually putting the objects in a data store in, in the cloud, uh, distributed around the network, it gets uh, un unwieldy to manage. And the thing is that even if you put those objects in a data store in the cloud, you don't really win anything from that, because you don't really win reliability. Because uh, Git doesn't give a shit about cap. Uh, it wasn't designed for cap in mind, because it's a version control system. It's not a, it's not a data store, uh, most people think. So if you're trying to distribute that around the network to make it uh, redundant or, or, on, or reliable, you got to keep in mind that to perform a usual Git operation, like a Git log on a big repo, or walk in the tree, it's going to take like a, a million hops on that graph. And if that graph is distributed across the network, it's not, it's not only going to be expensive, it's going to be very, very hard to complete. Because the amount of hops needed to make that successful query is more or less exactly one million. So if you miss a single hop from that operation, the operation doesn't really finish. It's not successful. And that makes that the amount of uh, redundancy that you need to make sure that if a node goes down, the whole graph can still be queried. It's basically a metric shit ton. It's extremely expensive to have that amount of redundancy to make sure that even if a single node of the network goes down, you, you still have enough objects left to perform a full query without having to fail it. Uh, now, this is something that is hard, but it's not, not even close to impossible. We definitely could fix this. And in fact, we've been trying to do that for a while. But, but we won't do that. Not because we can't, but uh, because it's not this, our style. It's not the way we work. And as it, as it turns out, uh, three years have happened since I started working on libgit 2. And it's gotten to the point where the library is mostly finished. We actually use it in production now. We use it on the backend for GitHub.com. We use it on our native app. We use it, Microsoft uses it on Visual Studio. So it's a very solid library now. It works very well in production. And it's allowing us to do things we've always wanted to do with Git on the backend without having to go cloud or NoSQL or WebScale or whatever. Our new infrastructure is called Git RPC, and it's about less. It's not exciting. It's the opposite of exciting. It's a simple uh, RPC server written in Ruby, which runs on the file server. And it doesn't have Erlang anymore. It's just pure Ruby, and there's only C under it. So we have uh, Ruby bindings to leave it to. And the stack looks something like this right now. Because we roll out Git RPC in production. We've been rolling out really now for six months now. And it runs right now next to Grid still. So Grid still goes through any all that bullshit. And Git RPC is much more straightforward. It hits the file servers directly, it performs the operation, and it brings it back to the front ends. And there is not, none of that fancy uh, uh, Erlang, uh, web scale, whatever. It's just Ruby and C under it. And the, on the wire, it's not even a uh, BERT anymore. It, we're actually using message pack. Uh, we're actually using BERT right now, but we're going to switch to message pack. So the whole point of it is that as we start rolling new features on GitHub.com, we always implement all of those using Git RPC. And we keep the old ones running Grid, and we slowly rewrite them. In fact, now there are very, very few features in GitHub.com that still go through the old Grid pipeline. And as soon as we port everything over to use Git RPC, we'll just take down the Grid pipeline. It's going to look something like this. Git RPC client, uh, pure Ruby on the client, it's just routing through chimney, and then his Git RPC server, which is simply Ruby again, and see, let get you under it. Now, this took about uh, six months of implementing, three years to write the library, and it's not exciting, it's not web scale, it's not cool, and it's, but we are very excited about it ourselves because it's a great show of the way we work. Like, it took a lot of effort to make something that is faster, it has less lines of code, it has less languages, it uses less databases, and it's not revolutionary, it's the opposite. It's evolutionary and probably disappointing, but that's the way we wanted to do it. Uh, this is not related to Git directly, but I think it's something that I really like to talk about and I think is very important <laughs> about the way that GitHub works. It's, uh, it's not about being cool or exciting, but about making software that works. 
So over the years, we've had a lot of problems. We've had to face very big scaling challenges, engineering challenges, because nobody hosts, no, nobody hosts more code than us. And we had to face uh, problems that nobody had faced before. Now, the secret uh, to tackling these things, even if it's not related to Git itself, most of them are Git related, but we managed to do this mostly by uh, using tools that we know very well. And that's basically GitHub secret. Like, uh, instead of using whatever is cool now, like Node.js or Go or whatever thing is in now, using old school tools that we know very well how they work, that we know they work reliably, that we really understand, that gives great results in, in, at, the, at the end. And especially challenging ourselves all the time to build the simplest thing, not because it's easy, because it took us like, three years to build a new Git library, like Git 2. But it's worth it at the end, because it's less lines of code, it's less languages, less databases, less uh, interactions between pieces. And that's what we, we really care about. And especially, especially when it comes to GitHub, it's uh, innovating where it really matters. Like, instead of trying to focus on building some kind of crazy, amazing, uh, scalable Git backend on the, on the backend, just keep shipping features for GitHub.com uh, make Git to make using Git easier. So that's what really worked for GitHub when it comes not only to building the backend, but also the whole product, the whole website, the whole company. This is building a revolutionary product instead of a revolutionary backend. It doesn't apply only to Git, it applies to everything else we do. And every time I give this talk, like, uh, people end up pretty miserable, because it's like, uh, but my job is going to be super miserable if I have to write C all day. Like, I need to write Scala or Clojure or Go to be happy. Uh, no, you don't. I mean, most of you are neckbeards. You're in a Git conference. You're used to writing C. I bet you even write Perl, which is disgusting. But, <laughs> but the point is that you don't need to use the shiniest new toy to have fun writing software. Like, you can, you can have fun doing a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of old school languages that you know are going to work very well. And people say that, that it's a depressing job. Like, if you're going to write systems code, you're going to write Java, or you're going to do old school stuff that is not web skill or whatever, it's going to be depressing. But I can tell you that uh, I, love, I love doing this. And these last four years, it's been a lot of work, but it's also been a shit ton of fun. So, so yeah, uh, you should try that for a change. Let's web scale a more like software that works. Thank you. Man, that went on for a while. Sorry that took so long. I wanted to be 20 minutes, so it's been 26. Uh, we still don't have many more speakers, but uh, of course, if anybody has a question, I would love to. Uh, a, any kind of question regarding uh, the, our Git backend, the way GitHub works, or anything you want, I'm going to be around all fucking day. I get paid to do this, actually. So just come up to me and ask anything you want. I love talking about our backend, the library, how can you help us with all the open source we do. So by all means, find me and ask me whatever you want. And now Scott wants to say something. Scott, do you want to say something? <laughs>